And I think it brings us into the question of why do we have nuclear arms? I don't think they are military weapons. I think they are arms of ultimate defense, defense of a civilization, of something that regards itself as so valuable that it is not only permitted but obliged to have weapons that ordinarily would be at God's command. So as it says in Numbers, just the sparks came from God's fingers. That was done in Hiroshima, Nagasaki, to punish the pagans who had been trampling on sacred soil. Namely, touching Hawaii was not a part of the US at the time, but it was a US territory. So I think it's a weapon of ultimate defense and ultimate punishment. And for them to give up that, I think, would be very, very tough. So that was the evangelical civilization in the US. The Anglican civilization followed up. The Catholic secular one followed up. The Confucian one followed up. Of course, before that, you had the Orthodox. So you had three, four Christianities and the Confucian. Then you have filled what ultimately was to become the Security Council, or Insecurity Council, depending on how you look at it even adding to atomic powers, the veto powers. Then somebody else came up. There was a Judaic bomb under protection of the Christians. Maybe not the Orthodox that much, but it should not be forgotten that the first ally of Israel was Soviet Union. After that, France. It's in 1967 that USA came into the picture. Then came, of course, indeed, the Hindu bomb, first as a device in 71, then as a real bomb in 1998, came the Islamic bomb and was announced by Ali Bhutto as the Islamic bomb from Pakistan. Now, is there a Persian bomb in the coming? <coughs> Their arguments would be that the Persian civilization is older than the Christianities. would be one important argument. Personally, I don't think that's what they're doing. I think it's very important for them to think that others think that they're doing that. They're playing a very dangerous poker game, kind of a, almost Russian roulette. But what I am saying <coughs> is that these are ultimate weapons. And they are weapons signaling to the world how important we are, at least in our own eyes. So whenever you have a civilization of some kind or another, I would expect atomic weapons to come up. Now, how does one solve that? One solves it by doing exactly what the American Catholics did in 1983 and followed by the United Methodist Church. And it was beautiful. Two small pamphlets saying that God did not create us in order to convert us into radioactive ashes and smithereens. God created us as an act of love for us to love each other. In other words, you go straight to the center, the theological justification. And you will see my point. I do not think they are military weapons. I think they are theological statements. For that reason, to talk about balance and things of that kind, the way you talk about ordinary weapons, I think is out of touch with reality. <coughs> it's very idealistic and blue-eyed. I myself have blue eyes, actually. But uh, I don't think it has any touch of reality to it. And I repeat, it was the Catholic Church in America and the United Methodists with purely theological arguments that touched Ronald Reagan's heart and made him say, these weapons should never be used. It was mainstream America. Now, added to this comes today non-state actors. And today comes the famous problem of who is the sender. So imagine that you have a nuclear bomb, as I wrote back in 1965, that's ridiculous to send it by a missile. A missile follows a parabola. You can make some variation with some random moves. But at the point where it starts getting close to the target, you can shoot it down. Much better is to put it in the locker at the railway station and then have a remote control like we all have for our TV sets. Now, in the meantime, they have started controlling the lockers, as you know, so you have to find somebody else. 
You just have to miniaturize it and bring it in, not with a missile, but uh, in a rucksack, for instance, a backpack. And then you write a nice little letter saying that here are our demands. And um, we have installed two, three of these devices. The first one will explode within 48 hours if you haven't reacted to it. Now, how do they find the sender? Not so easy for retaliation. So if you want my conclusion on that one, Try to identify the underlying conflict and solve it for heaven's sake. That's what we are doing in Transcend. We try to find out what's the underlying conflict. I've been mediating in about 120 of those and had some success in about 20. So, um, underlying conflict. Which are the goals that the parties stand for and how can you accommodate them? I haven't seen anything of that in Obama's approach. I have seen him partly to the right of Bush in most of the world, in Latin America, in Korea, Japan. I've seen it in his policies in the Middle East, in spite of the rhetoric. Not because he's right wing, but because George Bush was essentially lazy and Obama is super active. So that when he enacts the US code, then it comes out that way. I haven't seen any effort to understand what the Taliban stands for, what Hamas stands for, what Hezbollah stands for, what Al-Qaeda stands for. In order to do that, you have to talk with them. And you have to do the kind of thing that I do as an NGO mediator. Mr. Talib, what does the Afghanistan look like where you would like to live? And then he answers very quickly, point one, point two, point three. You take it from there. Then you go to his colleague in the State Department, Mr. State Department for state terrorism as opposed to Taliban terrorism. What does the world look like where you would like to live? And he answers point one, point two. Then the task, an agonizing task, is to find out how could you make them gel, come together. So we are in a dangerous situation, but not impossible. And I repeat, I think UK has a chance to be the prime mover. If I may quote a point from the lecture I'm going to give now, there was once a father and a son in Liverpool. They were slave traders. And the son said to the father, or maybe it was his uncle, I think it was the uncle, Uncle, it's really not very nice what we do, you know, these are human beings and uh, we are just scouring them together, the ships, and sending them and they die. And the uncle said, when I was young like you, I used to think like that too. But I have of course come to realize that slaves have to be bought and they have to be sold. So if we don't do it, somebody else will do it. Well, England managed to get out of that logic and abolished the slave trade. Because the logic is totally logical. It's a snake biting itself in the tail and swallowing itself. England managed to get out of it. That's a long story how it happened. And English women played an important role in it. So, you see what I'm addressing now? I'm sitting in front of one wonderful English woman. Where are you when we need you? Greenham Common. Fantastic. That's the way.